Welcome back to this Let's Play of Christopher Columbus is an Idiot. It's been four whole years since I did one of these things. I used to do them a couple times for Columbus Day. Finally returning them, but maybe we'll finally finish off playing the rest of the game here. Um, so now we are going on one of the quests to find one of the other ships. This is their Cervantes and Don Quixote quest, which is, I think, probably the best design quest of this game, or uh, at least the, the funniest one. So there's a lot of dipperish guy, dipperish dialogue with this guy right here. As you can see, his eyes are sort of gibbering along with his his mouth, which suggests that he's not not entirely with it. Uh, so the whole the whole idea behind this quest is that uh, there's a uh, what do you call it? <laughs> oh, I completely blanked. What do you call these things? There's a, 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 a duel, there's a rivalry, well, that's the word, a rivalry between uh, Don Quixote and Cervantes. And of course, Cervantes was the, the guy who actually wrote the Don Quixote story. Uh, so it's sort of fiction <laughs> matching off against reality. But you're not entirely clear uh, exactly what's reality and what's fiction. And Don Quixote is kind of a crazy character, right? Right here, you can sort of pick this, like a nonsense dialogue uh, jabbering at each other and just kind of escalates and gets more ridiculous. There's like, I actually had a like, kind of goofy friend in college where we would have these conversations where you just sort of spit nonsense back and forth at each other and he was a funny guy to talk to but uh, I'm pretty sure he got kicked out of college for smoking entirely too much pot uh, which was unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, he was. This, that was the sort of basis of that aimless gag which I sort of cut short when playing it through here. So, here is the the clue that you were able to get into. Normally, you can't find the house until after you've talked to him and you get the little password. So now we're gonna go traipsing across. Uh, one of the criticisms that I got from this game is that there was a little bit too much walking back and forth, which is one of those things that doesn't really seem that apparent when you're designing it. And then you go back and play it, and you're like, yeah, this is this is totally is just way too much. And you'll see more of that right here. So I feel a strange tingling sensation was a little bit of dialogue from King's Quest VI. Uh, one of those little goofy things the narrator says anytime you transport between all the, um, the islands in that game. And so here now you're actually talking to Zervantes and it just seems like he's a guy uh, hanging out in his house. And he sort of fills you in about the background between him and Don Quixote and how ridiculous it all is. If you notice his eyes are sort of jiggling in the same way, uh, which suggests that he also might not have all, uh, you know, be, not be all there. He might be lying to you for some reason. So the apples are supposed to suggest that something is, is not entirely right because, uh, you, you know, apples kind of remind, at least I thought of Snow White. Like, well, it's obviously poisonous, which it, it kind of is, but we'll see that when we get to it. So we decided to talk to the arms dealer, and we, we took this really literally that he sells you literally different types of arms. Uh, we need these skeleton arms for a puzzle coming up ahead. And we'll also be doing the, the second set of arms just to show what it is. We can't get them right now because we need to go on a quest before we get there. Um, the, the, the strong Popeye arms, I think we call them. I'm interested in this. That particular line of dialogue is obviously from uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night and the Shopkeeper. I think there's some dialogue that was probably lifted from Resident Evil 4 because those are the, the most infamous video game merchants, I think. Uh, the Dolphin Tears, part of these quests were uh, written by my brother who supplied a lot of dialogue and ideas. Uh, <laughs> this is for one of the other, uh, to get the third boat which we'll be doing eventually later.
the ZZ burning back and forth back to back to Cervantes again. Give him the apple. Kind of click past the dialogue a little bit too quickly, but um, there's a, <laughs> anytime you don't want to animate something, you just say the character is talking about what it is and just make things kind of easier. His magic obscures reality, you see. And that's, uh, again, one of those lines that sort of suggests that this blurs the line between fantasy and reality. So this next puzzle involves getting into the bathroom door over there, which you can't do because it's locked, as we'll, we'll very shortly see. And you can get a hint. Actually, you, you pretty much, this puzzle needs to be explained by uh, Abuelita here. Because otherwise none of this is going to make any remote level of sense. I'm probably repeating myself because I haven't watched the previous Let's Play videos we did, so I don't remember what I said. But a lot of this was written around the time of Occupy Wall Street, which was almost a decade ago. Uh, so the, the the guys at the bar were supposed to be representative of like you know like Wall Street cokeheads. Like the the idea was that in the 14th or 15th century, that the, those all all the math nerds would would be the the jocks of the day. Uh, so you need to find some way to piss them off. Okay, and here's Galileo, and he actually serves two functions here. Um, we actually, he, he's decoding the poem that you got from Francis Drake, and that tells you the location of another, uh, another boat out in the sea. This was a parody of a puzzle from Gabriel Knight 3, where I think it's called Les Serpent Rouge. And you spent what felt like half of the game going through all these arcane things to figure out how to solve that puzzle and I really just hated it um, when I did when I put out the adventure game book uh, I made specific mention about how much I hated that puzzle in the review and then some other website reviewed the book and was like I can't believe the guy didn't like the lace serpent rouge puzzle I'm like well it is what it is so this was my way of sort of sticking to it where the puzzle was was so nonsense that it was literally impossible to solve because, I mean, Christopher Columbus kind of zones out when Galileo explains it to you. Uh, so there's a lot of dialogue here that suggests what you're supposed to be doing, and that's to intimidate Galileo to giving you the answer because there's no way you'll ever figure it out. And, and going back over this, I still don't entirely know if that was telegraphed well enough or even if that was a good idea. Uh, uh, but for this, we need to grab this wand that turns water into wine which will be used pretty soon again and now the other utility here earlier on we painted our rabbit buddy as a skunk and we dropped this down here uh skunking beer happens it's basically just when beer goes bad um uh, when it's uh you talk to galileo and he explains that when uh, too much light gets it and i realized that not everybody was an alcohol drinker so there's a lot of explanation what it is in order to to get the idea that you're literally skunking the beer so now you, you know they pick you up and they they toss you into the or they try to toss you into the toilet except the whole thing is just a disaster and you'll see that they got grabbed by a purple tentacle because we're all about the lucas arts uh those the sound effects were lifted explicitly from the Famicom Disk System version of Zelda 2, which had all these weird extra sound effects when you fought the bosses, and I thought they were just goofy. And here's the puzzle where you need to get the uh, uh, the lance that was stuck in the toilet for the first set of arms. The labels here are some of the stuff are actually pretty goofy. I, I tried to put a lot of jokes like in because they were um, the, oh, the door out of this hellhole is what it said. This is sort of jokes that are unique to adventure games. 
so you look at the lance here and it says it's made out of tin and we'll look at it later and see how it it changes a little bit so there there were parts in the game where you wouldn't have access to your rabbit because he was also supposed to be a hint system uh, and the whole idea is that you would become attached to him because you would leave him whenever he was outside of your control you would you know you didn't have that crutch to to lean on and in this particular case he's gone this the, the vulture comes out of nowhere or the hawk comes out of nowhere and takes him away uh, and then he's back almost immediately so it in the end didn't really matter uh, now to get past the bear this little lake has all sorts of fish in it so you just turn that turn the water into wine and then you get the fish from it and uh, since they've been swimming in the wine they're all filled with wine and you give it to the bear which just puts him asleep There's that little visual glitch where, you know, he goes out of the sleeping animation to the stomping animation. I never figured out why that happened. Okay, so this is uh, a sort of exasperatingly long meta joke where this little sign here says that there's nothing important at the end of the maze. And it's right, there is nothing important here at the end of the maze. And in each of these screens, there is a little plaque that tells you, uh, taunts you a little bit more about how you're wasting your time. And it's right, because there is nothing useful at the end of this maze. In fact, it's not even really a maze. It's what I call a Zack McCracken maze. And that as long as you keep moving forward, you'll advance. But if you turn backwards, then uh, you'll leave. So there actually is an item behind there. It's it's a, it's a shaggy dog, which is, again, just a literal, a very literal joke. And you can use that to distract the dog in the other plot line um, at the game show. I didn't want the uh, didn't want the the puzzle things to cross over with each other, um, but that was sort of like it's not necessary, but it makes the puzzle a little bit easier. Uh, anyway, here now that we've gotten back to here, you you look at the lance, and then all of a sudden, it's all super powered. This little tear in reality, uh, that was a personal joke going back to Alex Kid in America World for the Sega Master System, which I got when I was like six years old. And at the end of the level, there are these little things that kind of look like tears in the scenery. And they were actually supposed to be rice balls, which of course I had no idea what a rice ball was. Uh, but for a long time, and then you know, between levels he ate it, which was even weirder. Uh, but I just kind of went with it uh, in this game. That's what the design was. And, and here, you know, Don Quixote comes back and he has a rocket pack. And here's Cervantes dressed as a pirate. The whole idea is that Cervantes is sort of like how he was uh, portrayed in Soul Calibur as this like badass pirate dude. So now they are, they're off back in the in the backyard. They're going to be fighting each other. And I felt this whole thing was a little bit too bizarre that you needed another character to come out and explain exactly what was going on. Uh, so I brought in Rodrigo here to, to to lay out to the player exactly what was happening. Super Don Quixote. I think that was the name of that uh, Laserdisc adventure, a uh, Laserdisc game that used footage for some Lupin uh, game. So in order to stop some fighting, I don't think, I'm not entirely sure if you can even leave this area. So this is Dulciana, which is a character from the actual Don Quixote story, which I actually don't know much about. I mean, I read up about it when I made this game and I've completely forgotten it now. She doesn't do anything. She's just a, it's like a sort of joke because this was a horse before. Uh, and then the horse is an actual woman and she had a lot of terrible horse puns, but there, she has no reason. So you can throw the apple at it and it actually does uh, fix a delusion. If I remember correctly, you can actually give the apple to either Don Quixote or Cervantes, and this whole scenario plays out slightly differently. And there was some intention that depending on who you threw the apple toward, it would change something really late in the game. But I, I definitely can't remember what that was supposed to be. I definitely never got around to implementing it either. So he takes off into the sky, and that part of the quest is done. Uh, so now we need to go back to getting the third one. 
Uh, where am I going? Oh, okay. We need to get the dolphin tears. And we have this box of chocolates that was given from uh, the little poet guy to give to his girlfriend in the other town. So we've, uh, the whole idea is you're supposed to get them to break up, which is a very Monkey Island 2 sort of scenario. And you use that by exchanging the chocolates with garbage. Uh, so in doing this, uh, she'll you know, break up with him. So now his, his facial expression changed a little bit. And if you talk to him, then he'll read you some really, really awful, depressing poetry. And the whole idea is that it'll be so sad that the dolphins will cry. I'm pretty sure I got my wife to write this really awful, like intentionally bad emo poetry. So when replaying this, I guess it was kind of glitchy. He's not supposed to offer you the arms again because there's nothing to do with them. Uh, I don't think it really harms anything, though. Anyway, now we have the Popeye strongman arm, so we can, again, traipse all the way back to Galileo. Since you can turn up the speed so much, it isn't really... At least it doesn't take up a whole lot of time, but if it was like one of those old, like especially like a, a LucasArts game where you couldn't tune tune up the speed uh, I'm sure it would be borderline unplayable I don't know why he gets that accent when he puts on his arms so obviously the the coordinates of the ship were randomized with every game I think you could like go out into the map and start shooting the cannonball into different areas and after you did it enough then the game would make some sort of retort there were a lot of little hidden easter eggs that if you tried things that the game didn't expect, it would reward you with a goofy little puzzle. So here we found this guy. I don't remember why, but the, the code had referred to him as Michael Kane, So he, he was supposed to be the sort of voice that this character would have. And he's run into an existential crisis that you need to talk him out of. And we'll see how we do that very shortly. So the premise of this puzzle is that you need to go down into his cabin and get his sock puppet friend and create a story that he'll like and it'll cheer him up. And you get all this stuff by looking around his room to get an idea of what his tastes are and you use that to craft up the story. And this was actually conceptually a very neat puzzle even though I don't know if it was executed particularly well. There's a report card from a ninja stool school as stealth. You got an F. There's a, a severed arm on the wall. Again, this is important to pay attention to. It's his first chainsaw victory. So, this letter reveals his backstory where he was in some sort of ninja club and he was kicked out for a ridiculous reason. I'm pretty sure there was, that was because of uh, one of those Godfrey Ho Ninja Commandments movies. Like,. That's the reason why the, the main character got kicked out. It just it didn't make any It's just completely ridiculous. So it was important to hear. So now we bring out the sock puppet. And it's, it's a dialogue puzzle. And uh, we'll, we'll see some of the, the items that, or dialogue selections that pop up. So he starts with a, 
um, the opener of where he lived, and there's a, a thing of outer space, so you figure, oh, I should be picking the things based off of what I saw. And I thought that was a good clue in of what you're supposed to be. So he had a he had a girlfriend, so he assumed he wanted to be with a lady uh, lady friend. Then about the ninja assassins, his favorite weapon was, well, he had a severed arm from a chainsaw, so he must love chainsaws. His bed was a dragon, so why not? And I'm doing all the correct answers here just to get through this puzzle. But he'll, he'll actually uh, say if you got any of the ones wrong. Like, he won't he'll say, I don't, I don't really know. And there's a, a sort of an internal points thing. I don't remember exactly how many questions there are or how many you needed to get right. Uh, you didn't need to get all of them. I think uh, it was a 10-ish question. You only needed 7 correct. And that, that was close enough because... It's, it's no fun to ever play these sort of dialect puzzles over and over and over and over and over again. So that was a good bit of leeway. He does give different dialogue depending on what your story score was. So at this point, he asks you to, to name the play, and there's only, like, four different choices. Again, I think there was, like, really late in the game, this would come back, and they were, depending on what title you gave your play, like, you, you left Spain, and then you go around the world, and the very last chapter, you would come back, and, uh, like, that actually became a play, and it was super popular. So now we've beaten everything here. We go back to the Queen of Spain and we are heady, ready to go on to the final, or, well, not the final, the second act of the game, which was actually the first part that I ever designed. And you'll see some stuff here. But anyway, there probably should have been a title card. On the title screen of the version I have to download, you can hit act two and it sort of starts you off right here. Uh, since this isn't done, I'm just gonna go and show some of the things here. I had left the debug function in Adventure Game Studio on for this build. I don't even remember the code to do it, but you can use it to sort of jump around. Because there's some things, there's some items that you can't actually get, some rooms and puzzles that, um, the way this is set up right now, you can't access. So I'm not gonna bother doing those right now. So here's the central conceit of the game was that Christopher Columbus found, um, you know, India, quote unquote, and just gave traditionally Indian names to the Native American people. And they, they, they didn't like it, but would just kind of go along with them because the general thing is they just wanted, well, just wanted to be left alone. You can go towards, like, uh, he thinks that's, I think that's that little... Uh, TP back there is the Taj Mahal, so that's what the dial uh, the little um, label says. He thinks a turkey is an elephant. That comes up again later. There's a lot of goofy dialogue that you can have with uh, poor Gupta here. I'm not gonna go through all of it. I mean, it's it's available to download if you want to mess with it. But you can sort of see how this was the first the first set of rooms because th this whole room was designed with a blank spot in the bottom. I figured out that the game would have an interface like the like the LucasArts games, like Monkey Island 2 did. Uh, in the end, it, I implemented it with something that was closer to the Sierra games. So, you know, if this had ever actually was going to be completed, these would need to be redrawn or at least have something down there. And here at this point, Gupta lies to you and sends you off. They're like, yeah, there's totally this uh, lost city of spice that you would go to. And that's what sent you off a new adventure. And here's some other stuff that's around. This has a map screen. Again, sort of like Melee Island from Monkey Island to make traveling a little bit easier. Um, for this playthrough, we're going to be just looking at this town because most of the stuff here was at least implemented in some fashion. So here's a character named Vincent Signpost. He was supposed to be uh, something that would sort of explain the background of the world. And uh, 
the joke is he was literally a signpost and he's completely out of out of the era he's a he's a talking robot you could sort of see his that, that blinking thing was supposed to be like a speaker talking I'm not gonna go through all the dialogue options, but his whole bit is that if you ask him about something that's not related to the town or what he's programmed to do, he just, uh, well, we'll see. And he just explodes. He'll be back in the, when we come back here. Um, if I remember correctly, the, the angle which his head flies off is uh, randomly generated to some extent. So this is the Le Hip Bar, and it is starring the purple smoking pirate pig from Wonder Boy the Dragon Strap. Um, when this uh, game was made, he was sort of the unofficial mascot of the website that I had barred from my Twitter and Facebook icon, and I think even on the HE 101 forums is still the thing, but... So the whole thing is he doesn't let you in unless you have a hipster turkey, and these are the three hipster judges which just sort of sit behind that, um, <laughs> that curtain. And the idea is that you would need to do three different things to dress up your turkey based off of what they look like. Like one guy had a wool cap, so you need to knit it. One guy had a ridiculous mustache, so you need to grab some buffalo fur and stick it on. And the third guy had a pair of goofy glasses. So this was the alternative store, which was a parody of these sort of, um, you know, Native American stuff that was commercialized for white people, which had somehow made its way to the Americas before Columbus even got here. It's one of those things you're not supposed to think too much about. I think there may have been some backstory because the whole thing was ruled by Archibald Hoare and the, the nemesis from the previous chapter. I think there was supposed to be some sort of um, a rivalry between them and the Haversham thing. Okay, so this is another goofy thing. You see right here, this little air message that popped up, she tries to give you a pair of scissors and... Uh, it gives an error message, and it's not a real error message. It's something that, um, you know, Columbus acknowledges that, like, well, <laughs> th th this item you're supposed to give me disappeared, and she doesn't know what you're talking about. This is going to be one of the last things we'll look at here. So it prints out the error message so you get an idea of what to look at. Some of this lingo is actually very close to what the game code look like. Like, C Ego is what the main character is referred to. We're not going to go to the other areas right here. So, the whole idea is that there was no room that was actually put in here, so you just sort of fall out of nothing into the game code. And you were supposed to use those little pluses and minuses to uh, fix the inventory and get the shears that you were supposed to find. Uh, but that never got implemented. In fact, it, if you try to go back in, it won't even let it. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, you can sort of futz with some other stuff yourself. Uh, maybe one day I'll go back and do some of the other, other goofy things. Uh, but that should do it.